to recap. Mind-brain identity theory. Mind is experience of brain activity. If you like, you could say that that mind is the brain's experience of its own activity. But I don't like that. Uh, another way of putting it is that it's the theory that the brain makes the mind. Right? The reason you have a mind or the reason you are a mind is because there is a physical object a biological object, a part of an organism, an organ in a biological machine that is making your mind. Now, this leads very nicely into the doctrine, into the doctrine of functionalism. Today's lecture, functionalism and the more or less stupid objections to it. And that pen's not going to work. Okay. Monday we talked about how the brain makes the mind, how the brain call, brings the mind into existence. Right. Well, we're talking about the relationship between the brain and mind, okay? Brain does something, mind happens. something, mind happens. Functionalism is the doctrine that any device that did the same things would make a mind. Okay. Anything that did what your brain does would make a, bra a mind. And if that thing did what your brain does in absolutely exactly the same way that your brain does what it does, that machine would make a mind that thought it was you. Remember, when I say your mind, I mean everything. Your, all of your thoughts, sarcasm, um, distress, um, wondering what you're going to have for lunch, boredom, um, everything, all your beliefs, all your beliefs about the world, all your beliefs about the, yourself, beliefs about the universe, about people. Reactions, the ways you react to various situations, that's all part of your mind and it's all made by your brain. One analogy is if you've ever played uh, a video game or a uh, online game, there is a computer somewhere that is doing that game. It 
So every time you have a thought, that is a neurological event. All of your thoughts are in neurological events. And all of the things, and there's tons of stuff that goes on in your brain that does not make it into your consciousness, and therefore, but still counts as part of your mind. You have to think about having unconscious beliefs, unconscious prejudices. All part of your mind, all done by the brain. It's done by things called neurons. How many of you know what a neuron is? Three, four. Okay. Neurons are very important. Without them, you don't exist. Here's a diagram of a neuron. It's a pretty crappy diagram, but I'm not a biologist. Now, Okay, you don't need to know the names of the parts, but I happen to know them and putting them up there makes me look like I know what I'm talking about. The important thing is, neurons have input devices, they have a processor, and they have an output device. Um, Neurons are, most neurons are way more complicated than this. The axons are long in proportion to the body um, size. They may have thousands of dendrites. The arborization at the end of the um, axon may be very complicated. But this is a simple diagram. And you've got millions of these, billions of these in your head. And the number of ways, of, of possible ways of hooking them up, of, of of sending signals through this. The number of possible signals, uh, signal patterns in your brain is larger than the number of particles in the universe. The brain has what is we might as well call infinite possibility. Now I want you to what I'm going to do, I want you to follow me in a thought experiment. Okay? I want you to imagine that we've made that in addition to flesh neurons, <coughs> in addition to flesh neurons like these, see the red, so the flesh. Um, you can imagine that they make they can make artificial neurons. See what goes on in a neuron is that it accepts signals. And in fact, the signals in your brain are, are binary. A synapse is either firing or it's not. Where well, one neuron gets close to another neuron, like right, when the, um, a dendrite from one neuron, sorry, when an axon from one neuron gets close to a dendrite from another neuron, it forms what's called a synapse, which looks nothing like that. Um, and synapses are either firing or they're not. So it's binary signaling. On, off, on, off, on, off, on, off. And these signals go to the cell body where they're processed. That is, the neuron either reacts or it doesn't, depending on the pattern of inputs. There's a program. Some inputs suppress, some inputs excite. And when it gets excited, when the neuron gets excited, it shoots and it sends a signal down, sends a signal down the axon, it activates, and then synapse at the end here, the synapses at the end here all fire. And 
<coughs> the signal is passed on to the other cells. So, back, 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 firing signals all the way across. And this is happening billions of times a second. It's happening, quite, it's happened quadrillions of times in your head as you listen to me. This is what accomplishes all that is true and good and beautiful about you. So it's a wonderful piece of biological machinery. Now, yes. Have we ever successfully cloned a human? Uh, no, and that's that's way off, way off topic for this class. I was thinking it's the the brain. Well, cloning is easy because if you you're using cellular machinery, it'll just make the brain. When they make clones, they just make uh, they they just put new DNA in a cell, and it it makes it the same way the other. So if we cloned you, um, your your clone brother would develop just the way you did. We'd have to, you know, have to be implanted in a womb and grow up naturally and so on. So cloning does not, but this doesn't really have anything to do with cloning. What this has to do with the idea of making an artificial neuron. Now, what this is, is, um, Every neuron is, in effect, a simple computer. <coughs> you've got a simple computer in this cell body. It processes information. So you've got billions of little computers in your head. Um, now, I want you to imagine that nanotechnology reaches the, the stage where we can make artificial neurons using silicon computer technology. So, and imagine that we have little nanobots. You guys know what a nanobot is? A nanobot is a little tiny robot that can be injected into the bloodstream and turn you into a ball. Well, a, a nanobot just imagine this little tiny worker robots. And what they do is they go into your brain and they find a neuron that's dying, so a sick neuron. And what they do is right next to it, they build Right next to it, just right on top of it, they build a mechanical neuron. Now, we can imagine this as electronic, but it doesn't matter, as long as it's not flesh and blood. It could be steam powered for all we know. There were mechanical computers. Now, what the uh, nanobots do is that they take the programming out of this neuron, and they put that programming into this artificial one. And the artificial one has exactly the characteristics of the original neuron, including the ability to change the way neurons change. This is how you learn <coughs> stuff, by the way. The way you learn stuff, or the way you change over time, where your personality changes, is your neurons get reprogrammed. Every change you make in your personality is a change in how your neurons fire, the firing programs for your neurons. And all of that can theoretically be put into a little machine. So this little machine does exactly what that neuron would have done if it was still there. And when the neuron dies, goes away, the little machine keeps going forever and ever. Now, I want you to imagine that you have a degenerative disease. You've got some kind of problem with the noggin. Um, and you go to your doctor and says, hey, we have this great treatment. We have these nanobots. And we inject them in your, in your bloodstream, and they go to your brain, and they look for 
dying neurons. They look for damaged neurons and they replace them with brand new mechanical neurons that do exactly what the neurons, your dying neurons would have done if they had been healthy. So, you get this injection, you get this treatment, you go about your daily business, completely unknown to you inside your brain that occurs a continuous process of these nanobots finding sick and dying neurons and replacing the dying ones with um, perfectly functional artificial neurons made of say, I don't know, cast iron powered by steam. But these artificial neurons do exactly what the old neurons would have done. Awesome. And so you don't lose brain function. Yeah, but you never make do a plane on time again. No, no, you can operate your brain while the plane is in flight. It's not like a cell phone. Oh, no, I'm talking about you never make it from Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I got these new artificial neurons in my head. That's why it goes off. Metal detector. Let's say they're silicon, okay, or ceramic or something, so that they don't set off metal detectors. Right. So, so you go back to your doctor, and every so often you get reports, and the doctor, first time the doctor says, well, they replaced 5% of your neurons. How do you feel? I feel great. I feel as smart as I did before I went in to see you. Right? The degenerative disease is progressing, but it's not affecting me because i got these other neurons to take out the slack. You go in in a few more weeks, and it's like, well, oh, totally 15% has been replaced. Five years down the line, they say, well, half your neurons are replaced. How do you feel? You say, great, because you're not going to notice any difference. These artificial neurons are doing what your old neurons, what your dying neurons would have done. So at this point, would you still be considered you or just a replica of you? Or well, that's, what, that's for you to decide. Uh, uh, that's a whole different lecture. That's the personal identity lecture. Um, but as far as you can tell, you are you. And then 10 years down the line, the, the doctor says, well, you can stop coming to see me. You say, why? Well, I don't need to monitor the progress of the disease because all your original flesh and blood neurons are dead. If we had not given you this treatment, you would be a vegetable now. All your neurons have died off. Everything's been replaced by silicon. And it does exactly what those neurons would have done. So you've learned things. You've changed and grown as a person, or perhaps you've degenerated. All right? Everything is the same as it would have been. Okay. Everything is the same as it would have been if you had lived, if your brain hadn't had the disease. And if you hadn't been, the only thing that's different is that you have not had any mental degeneration. Your brain has not lost any function whatsoever. True, it is no longer flesh and blood, but it has not lost any of the things that it used to do. So you are just as capable of love as you were before. Yes? Second? Um, well, the uh, well, we did sort of did the soul before. We did the soul with Descartes with the mind-body problem, where there's some immaterial thing that is not material at all, but somehow interacts with material things, and it logically just doesn't work. Um, and if you think about Hume, there's nothing in your experiences that functions as a container for your thoughts. You just have your thoughts. 
So self-examination does not reveal a soul. External examination does not reveal a soul. Um, there is nothing that happens. There is no observable that needs a soul to explain it. Absolutely everything uh, about the mind can easily be explained physically. So you could have faith that you have a soul. There's nothing wrong with that. You could have faith that you have two souls. You could have faith that you have a million souls. You have a faith, could have faith that you're actually in Madagascar right now, although it just doesn't look like it. So I'm, I'm just talking here about what what is best supported by the evidence available to us. And this view is the only one that's really supported by the evidence. Now, coming back to the mechanical thing, what you have now with your completely mechanical brain is a very elaborate computer program that's uh, accomplished by a set of distributed computers. What your brain is actually is a distributed computing network. Like the internet, only way, way, way bigger in terms of information capacity and flow. Your brain is much bigger and much more efficient than the internet. Uh, also, your brain has automatic, the, the little programming things, they don't have free will. Your neurons don't have free will. They can't mess you up. You need those neurons to behave exactly as programmed, or you'll, you'll be messed up. We'll talk about that uh, next week. Now, okay, now, any program accomplished on a distributed computing network can be accomplished by a, not a, by a straight computer. That is, you can take this and you can make a model. All the neurons are replaced now. All steam powered. Um, if they really were steam powered and you got angry, steam would come out of your ears, right? that program. You can copy it in, in theory. Actually, it's way too complicated to copy. You think it um, uh, takes a long time downloading a movie? Okay, this is like a billion movies worth of information. So you could not possibly do this simply by the constraints of the machinery. But let's say we've got really good computers, really super computers, and we can copy this program, put it into a computer, Okay, so let's suppose that I'm a mad scientist and during the night I come into your uh, uh, bedroom and I put a, 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 a colander covered in tinfoil on your head and I copy your exact program. Then I take your exact program put it into a computer and fire it up. And you know what the thing's going to say? First, it's going to say, where am I? What happened? What's going on? What have you done to me? Why am I stuck in this computer? Because this program will be so much like you that it will think it is you. If I copy your internal program exactly, there will be no difference. There will be a mind in there that's exactly like your mind at the time of copying, and that mind will obviously think it's you, and will be really, 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 really pissed off when it finds out it's a computer program. I mean, imagine you woke up tomorrow and found out you don't have a body at all, you're a computer program. Wouldn't that just tick you off? I think I'd be honest. So, now, for purposes of this exercise, for this example, I don't have to copy a mechanical program. I could copy your brain, if I could do this, 
I could copy your brains right now. I could copy the program in your brain right now, put it in a computer, fire it up, say, here, talk to yourself. And there'd be a very unpleasant conversation because, you know, the, the, the you in the box would be really ticked off. I don't know, though, it might be, you know, it depends on your personality. And you would have a computer that would know everything you knew and would have every memory that you had, including the embarrassing ones, but it would be okay because it would also have the memory of doing it. You wouldn't know it as this other person did it, you would know it as I did it. Okay. So this is all the doctrine of functionalism. Now I happen to think that functionalism is true. And the reason I think it's true is because the evidence supports it. Functionalism. To save time, I'm just going to say my brain identity theory. If my brain identity theory is true, functionalism pretty much has to do, be true. Have you ever tried to move a computer program across platforms? Have you ever tried to run a Mac program on a PC or a PC program on a Mac or on a Linux machine? Sometimes these programs can work, sometimes they can't. Have you ever seen a program that comes in a Mac version, a Linux version, a PC version, maybe a CPM version, if any of you have that kind of historical knowledge. Um, have you ever done a spreadsheet program? Mathematical program? Does it matter what kind of computer you do it on? Dell, Compaq, just still around, Fujitsu, Toshiba, right? Have you ever, well let's how many of you got thumb drives? Have you ever taken one of your documents, plugged it, you know, taken a thumb drive, plugged it in, a, in some computer in the computer lab, worked on your document, taken it out, taken it home, plugged it into your parents' computer, worked on it there, or, or your friend's computer? Yeah. Same document. Right? Say you've got Microsoft Word uh, 2007 on all three computers. It's set up exactly the same on all three computers. Does it matter which physical substrate the program is run on? What if some one of your friends is a lunatic who owns a steam-powered um, 
computer. Right? It's all pipes and hydraulics and steam and pistons and stuff, but it processes information exactly the way a real computer would. And okay, it would have to be huge. Even with the you know with Swiss watch technology, it would have to be huge to do this. But say he's got this huge machine, and it is set up to do exactly the same function the functions that Microsoft Word 2007 does, set up exactly the way it is on your home computer. You put the program in, you put your document in, you work it. Does it matter that the physical substrate is different? Suppose you open your friend's computer and find it's little elves running around, passing notes to each other and banging on things. But they do this in exactly the same pattern that Microsoft Word 2007 does in a computer. Same function, same function, right? Same function, same thing. It's, the, it's what, how the information is processed that matters, not the physical nature of the machine that does it. Functionalism says, because, because these things are true, Processes information the right way will make a mind. It doesn't matter if the information in your brain is being processed by elves, by neurons, by uh, jellyfish waving little semaphore flags to each other. As long as the information is processed the same way, you have the same experience, you will have a mind. difficulties in making an intelligent computer, a conscious computer, are technical. They're just, we don't have the computing power yet. We don't have the time to write all the programs involved. Although it will go, since, since it's a matter of neural nets, of training neural nets, it'll be, uh, it's doable. We're a long way from it, but it's, uh, it's in principle feasible. And there's no reason why we won't do it. All right. So, anything wrong with this? My brain identity theory is, is true. There's no uh, real argument against it. Mind, the brain does do the mind by processing the information, and the material basis of a process doesn't matter. Now, there's, there's some objections to, um, to functionalism, and I may not be able to get to all of them. Uh, the most sensible objection to functionalism still doesn't work, but, um, but it's really interesting. It's a very famous example. It's called uh, Searle's Chinese Row. Uh, I'll do it in red. Imagine there's a room with a guy in it who does not understand Chinese. And outside the room, there's someone writes questions in Chinese. Passes them to the guy. And the guy has a set of tables. Like these are supposed to look like books. The guy basically has um, 
a set of instructions that if you see, five, where's, what's the first symbol? Okay, if the first symbol is this, you go to this page. Now what's the second symbol? If the second symbol is this, you go to this page. So on this page it says, here's the first signal, symbol, here's the second symbol. If you've got that combination, uh, what's the third symbol? Okay, if the third symbol is this, you go over here and do this. Complicate, set of complicated instructions. Nowhere in the book is there a translation <coughs> of anything into English. The guy never knows the meanings of the symbols. But because of the set of rules, he's able to say, give answer. He's able to, because of the rules, he is able to come up with strings of Chinese characters that he writes on pieces of paper and passes out. Now, if you're outside the Chinese room, your experience is somebody writes questions in Chinese, passes them into the room, after a certain period of time, answers come out. Let's say the guy works really, really fast. He's a just total blur, opening and closing these books, following these instructions. He's working very, very fast. After a certain period of time, a slip of paper comes out with the answer in Chinese. You can ask, uh, what is the capital of Nigeria? And the answer comes out, hopefully, Lagos. Or, um, bad example. Um, I can't think of any other questions. Um, what is America's national pastime? And the answer comes back, baseball. complaining about baseball. It's a, it's a snarky room. Okay. The answer comes back, baseball. And go Angels. Uh, the, the, something goes in and says, you're a bastard. And it comes out, you're an asshole. Well, I'm not allowed to say those words. Um, but the guy in there doesn't even know the room's been insulted. Now, Searle says, Searle so says the room processes information, but it doesn't understand Chinese. Because right, you ask the guy in the room, do you understand Chinese? And he'll say, what's Chinese? I'm just messing with these symbols. Searle so says the room processes information, which is right, but it doesn't understand Chinese. can't do meaning. According to John Searle, machines cannot do meaning. Think about all the emails that go back and forth across the internet every day. Um, I, I had a debate on the radio um, on whether or not it's uh, okay to dump someone by email. Uh, no, uh, that was Kevin B. Um, and, or, or by text. 
why not? You can have a relationship by text now. Yeah, well, I guess, I mean, people do. Um, there are people on the internet that think that my daughter is an old Japanese woman living in Osaka. There are people who think she's a guy. They don't think she's a Greek guy that Greek guy that Well, she's never put that down as her address. She has put down that she lives in Osaka. So, um, but does the internet know any of this stuff? Does the internet understand the meaning of these messages? Does it know the heartbreak and joy that is, that is, that is passing on? No, it doesn't. It just processes the information. So, according to Searle, this example proves that machines can't do meaning. Cell says the room processes information, but it doesn't understand Chinese. But functionalism doesn't say that this is all that's happening. This is only a part of the kind of processing that goes on in your brain. Um, those of you, well, we all understand at least one language. Those of you who understand, have you ever, those of you who've learned a language, um, I think that there's a time when you sort of mentally translate things before you speak. You hear someone say something in the other language, you think about it, you process it, right? You think about it, you come up with what they're saying, you think about the answer in English, you think up the answer in English, then you translate that into the other language and say it out loud. Does that make any sense? Those of you who have other have learned other languages, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, okay, so you've got like two Chinese rooms in your head. You've got a chunk that goes from um, Chinese or whatever the other. The, my daughter's learning Japanese, so she's got. One time she had a, 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 a Japanese box that from Japanese to English. Think in English then translate the answer back into Japanese. Eventually that goes away. You can think in the other language. So this represent, doesn't represent a whole brain. This represents a chunk of a brain. And what do you mean that the thing doesn't understand Chinese? Well, let's put it this way. Let's say that you have someone, a human being, whose only capacity for understanding Chinese is to do what this room does. So you ask this guy in Chinese a question, and he gives you an answer in Chinese. And you ask him in English, well, what does that mean in English? And he says, I don't know. He has no idea because his brain is just doing what the Chinese room, the Chinese room is doing. It's not. It's got a chunk of his brain that does what this does, but he doesn't understand Chinese. But nobody's like that. What we're like is that when we have these processes, we have other processes as well that translate them things into things that we understand. So let's call this an English room, okay? You ask the room questions in English, and the guy inside doesn't speak English. You ask the person, the guy, the room questions in English, and you get answers in English. And the guy doesn't understand, but your neurons don't understand English either. This little guy in here is just doing what neurons do. So what's going on? What can we change this room, this example, so that it's more representative of what goes on in someone's head? Well, here's the thing. Here's something to think about. What if we put this room on tracks.
put the room on treads. And we'll put a little control panel in here. Now the control panel is marked in Chinese symbols. And maybe colored buttons. And the guy has no idea what the buttons do. And you write in Chinese on a piece of paper, go forward. He, goes out, he translates it, and at the end it says, push the red button. So he pushes the red button, the room moves forward. Put, push the blue button, again in Chinese. Imagine we have a little tiny Chinese room, perhaps with, with a mouse in there instead of a guy. And we're passing in the little instructions. So we'll do it verbally. It's not one. There's a lap, there's a, a microphone. Right? And we say, go forward. That's translated into a set of symbols. The mouse doesn't understand the symbols, but it has the translation rules, turns them into a, uh, an action, like push the button. That makes it move, makes it go, makes it turn left, go forward, stop, move. Okay, now, imagine we have a device like that, it's just by processing, like a Roomba or a little voice controlled doohickey, and you say, move forward, go back to... In the strictest definition of understanding, the box understands the commands, because the box knows how to put them into action. You say, give it the command, it goes into that. Make it more sophisticated. Add arms and legs. Add more memory capacity. Add um, hands, the ability to manipulate objects. Add processing so that it can make its own decisions. A little decision making thing there. So it's a, we say, if I say make coffee, it will access its memory for how to make coffee. It will go up to the coffee room and uh, look for coffee. Right? The mouse is working really, really hard in there because that's a lot of instructions. But the only difference between this and the Chinese room is that the behavior is more complicated. There's no qualitative difference. And I'm going to have to take a two minute break for a, a medical problem. I apologize.